What are cardiovascular diseases? The heart is one of the most amazing organs in the entire human body. This is an organ that works as a pump. It creates the pressure needed to eject blood into the major vessels and be transported throughout the entire body. Think about this function over the course of a lifetime. This magnificent organ will beat nearly 3 billion times during a 75-year lifespan. In any given year, your heart will pump about 2.6 million gallons of blood through about 60,000 miles of vessels. In order to accomplish such a task, you would think you would need a huge piece of machinery. But no, the human body accomplishes these feats by the pumping action of an organ about the size of your fist. When we think of cardiovascular diseases, it's important for us to remember that this is a catch-all phrase that's used to describe a variety of diseases of the heart and circulatory system. I want you to be careful that you look at table one in section one of this chapter for a closer look at this. But we can also look at some of the broad definitions of cardiovascular disease. Let's first look at atherosclerosis. This is also referred to as hardened or hardening of the arteries. In this condition, fatty material within the blood vessel will accumulate Leading to, leading to a narrowed opening and a restriction in blood flow. Now, this condition can lead to serious conditions, including heart attack, stroke, and even death. Coronary artery disease is the most common form of heart disease. Once again, this involves a reduction of blood supply to the heart muscle. This is characterized by atherosclerosis and can lead to heart failure. Heart failure is a medical condition that is often misunderstood. It basically is described as when the organ cannot pump efficiently and is unable to generate enough blood flow to meet the demands of the body. Congestive heart failure is the term that is generally used when there's a buildup of fluid around the heart. And it's important not to confuse this with a heart attack. A heart attack is the common name for acute heart failure, most often due to myocardial infarction following a blockage of a coronary artery. Blood pressure is the measure of force generated by the beating of the heart. When the heart contracts, the measurement is defined as systolic pressure. And when the heart is relaxed, the pressure is defined as diastolic pressure. Normal adult blood pressure should be less than about 140 over 90. 140 is the systolic and 90 is the diastolic measurement. High blood pressure is also called hypertension. Strokes are caused by either blocked or burst blood vessels in the brain. Let's listen to Dr. Jill Taylor describe this condition as it happened to her. But on the morning of December 10, 1996, I woke up to discover that I had a brain disorder of my own. A blood vessel exploded in the left half of my brain. And in the course of four hours, I watched my brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process all information. On the morning of the hemorrhage, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. I essentially became an infant in a woman's body. If you've ever seen a human brain, it's obvious that the two hemispheres are completely separate from one another. And I have brought for you a real human brain. Thank you. So this is a real human brain. This is the front of the brain, the back of the brain with the spinal cord hanging down. And this is how it would be positioned inside of my head. And when you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from one another. For those of you who understand computers, our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor, while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. The two hemispheres do communicate with one another through the corpus callosum, which is made up of some 300 million axonal fibers. But other than that, the two hemispheres are completely separate. Because they process information differently, 
Each of our hemisphere think about different things. They care about different things. And dare I say, they have very different personalities. Excuse me. Thank you. It's been a joy. <laughs> our right human hemisphere is all about this present moment. It's all about right here, right now. Our right hemisphere, it thinks in pictures, and it learns kinesthetically through the movement of our bodies. Information in the form of energy streams in simultaneously through all of our sensory systems, and then it explodes into this enormous collage of what this present moment looks like, what this pro present moment smells like and tastes like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I am an energy being connected to the energy all around me through the consciousness of my right hemisphere. We are energy beings connected to one another through the consciousness of our right hemispheres as one human family. And right here, right now, we are brothers and sisters on this planet here to make the world a better place. And in this moment, we are perfect, we are whole, and we are beautiful. My left hemisphere, our left hemisphere, is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past, and it's all about the future. Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous collage of the present moment and start picking out details, details, and more details about those details. It then categorizes and organizes all that information, associates it with everything in the past we've ever learned, and projects into the future all of our possibilities. And our left hemisphere thinks in language. It's that ongoing brain chatter that connects me and my internal world to my external world. It's that little voice that says to me, hey, you got to remember to pick up bananas on your way home. I need them in the morning. It's that calculating intelligence that knows, that reminds me when I have to do my laundry. But perhaps most important, it's that little voice that says to me, I am. I am. And as soon as my left hemisphere says to me, I am, I become separate. I become a single, solid individual, separate from the energy flow around me and separate from you. And this is a portion of my brain that I lost on the morning of my stroke. On the morning of the stroke, I woke up to a pounding pain behind my left eye. And it was the kind of pain, caustic pain, that you get when you bite into ice cream. And it just gripped me. And then it released me. And then it just gripped me. And then it released me. And it was very unusual for me to ever experience any kind of, of pain, so I thought, okay, I'll just start my normal routine. So I got up and I jumped onto my cardio glider, which is a full body, full exercise machine. And I'm jamming away on this thing, and I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping onto the bar. And I thought, that's very peculiar. And I looked down at my body, and I thought, whoa, I am a weird looking thing. And it was as though my consciousness had shifted away from my normal perception of reality, where I'm the person on the machine having the experience, to some esoteric space where I'm witnessing myself having this experience. And it was all very peculiar, and my headache was just getting worse. So I get off the machine, and I'm walking across my living room floor, and I realize that everything inside of my body has slowed way down. And every step is very rigid and very deliberate. There's no fluidity to my pace. And there's this constriction in my area of perception. So I'm just focused on internal systems. And I'm standing in my bathroom getting ready to step into the shower. And I could actually hear the dialogue inside of my body. I heard a little voice saying, OK, you muscles, you got to contract. And you muscles, you relax. And, and then I lost my balance. And I'm propped up against the, the wall. And I look down at my arm. And I realized that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin 
and where I end, because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was this energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what is wrong with me? What is going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter, went totally silent. Just like someone took a remote control and pushed the mute button, total silence. And at first I was shocked to find myself inside of a silent mind. But then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of the energy around me. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. And then all of a sudden, my left hemisphere comes back online, and it says to me, hey, we got a problem. We got a problem. We got to get some help. And I'm going, oh, I got a problem. I got a problem. So it's like, okay, okay, I got a problem. But then I immediately drifted right back out into the consciousness, and I affectionately refer to this space as La La Land. But it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you to the external world. So here I am in this space, and my job and any stress related to my, my job, it was gone. And I felt lighter in my body. And imagine all of the relationships in the external world and any stressors related to any of those, they were gone. And I felt this sense of peacefulness. And imagine what it would feel like to lose 37 years of emotional baggage. Oh, I felt euphoria. Euphoria. It was beautiful there. And then again, my left hemisphere comes online and it says, hey, you've got to pay attention. We've got to get help. And I'm thinking, I've got to get help. I've got to focus. So I get out of the shower and I mechanically dress and I'm walking around my apartment and I'm thinking, I've got to get to work. I've got to get to work. Can I drive? Can I drive? And in that moment, my right arm went totally paralyzed by my side. Then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm having a stroke. I'm having a stroke. And then the next thing my brain says to me is, wow. This is so cool. <laughs> this is so cool. How many brain scientists have the opportunity to study their own brain from the inside out? <laughs> and then it crosses my mind. But I'm a very busy woman. I don't have time for a stroke. It's like, OK, I can't stop the stroke from happening, so I'll do this for a week or two, and then I'll get back to my routine. OK, so I got to call help. I got to call work. I couldn't remember the number at work. So I remembered in my office I had a business card with my number on it. So I go into my business room. I pull out a three-inch stack of business cards. And I'm looking at the card on top. And even though I could see clearly in my mind's eye what my business card looked like, I couldn't tell if this was my card or not, because all I could see were pixels. And the pixels of the words blended with the pixels of the background and the pixels of the symbols, and I just couldn't tell. And then I would wait for what I call a wave of clarity. And in that moment, I would be able to reattach to normal reality. And I could tell, that's not the card, that's not the card, that's not the card. It took me 45 minutes to get one inch down inside of that stack of cards. In the meantime, for 45 minutes, the hemorrhage is getting bigger in my left hemisphere. I do not understand numbers. I do not understand the telephone, but it's the only plan I have. So I take the phone pad, and I put it right here. I take the business card, I put it right here, and I'm matching the shape of the squiggles on the card to the shape of the squiggles on the phone pad. But then I would drift back out into La La Land and not remember if when I come back if I'd already dialed those numbers. So I had to wield my paralyzed arm like a stump and cover the numbers as I went along and pushed them so that as I would come back to normal reality, I'd be able to tell, yes, I've already dialed that number. Eventually, the whole number gets dialed, and I'm listening to the phone, and my colleague picks up the phone, and he says to me, roo, roo, roo. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to myself, oh my gosh, he sounds like a golden retriever. <laughs> and so I say to him, clear in my mind, I say to him, this is Jill, I need help. And what comes out of my voice is, roo, roo, roo. And I think, oh my gosh, I sound like a golden retriever. So I couldn't know, I didn't know that I couldn't speak or understand language until I tried.
So he recognizes that I need help, and he, and he gets me help. And a little while later, I'm, I'm riding in an ambulance from one hospital across Boston to Mass General Hospital. And I curl up into a little fetal ball. And just like a balloon with the last, last bit of air just, just right out of the balloon, I just felt my energy lift and just I felt my spirit surrender. And in that moment, I knew that I was no longer the choreographer of my life, and either the doctors rescue my body and give me a second chance at life, or this was perhaps my moment of transition. When I woke later that afternoon, I was shocked to discover that I was still alive. When I felt my spirit surrender, I said goodbye to my life, and my mind was now suspended between two very opposite planes of reality. Stimulation coming in through my sensory systems felt like pure pain. Light burned my brain like wildfire, and sounds were so loud and chaotic that I could not pick a voice out from the background noise, and I just wanted to escape because I could not identify the position of my body in space, I felt enormous and expansive, like a genie just liberated from her bottle. And my spirit soared free like a great whale gliding through a sea of silent euphoria. Nirvana, I found nirvana. And I remember thinking there's no way I would ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. But then I realized, but I'm still alive. I'm still alive, and I have found nirvana. And, and if I have found nirvana and I'm still alive, then everyone who is alive can find nirvana and I pictured a world filled with beautiful, peaceful, compassionate, loving people who knew that they could come to this space at any time and that they could purposely choose to step to the right of their left hemispheres and find this peace. And then I realized what a tremendous gift this experience could be. What, what a stroke of insight this could be to how we live our lives. And it motivated me to recover. Two and a half weeks after the hemorrhage, the surgeons went in and they removed a blood clot the size of a golf ball that was pushing on my language centers. Here I am with my mama, who's a true angel in my life. It took me eight years to completely recover. That was quite an interesting video, wasn't it, told by the, through the voice of somebody who has experienced a stroke firsthand. I'd like to spend a little time now talking about cardiovascular disease and Western society. Cardiovascular diseases are the main cause of premature death, and that is death before the age of 75, in the United Kingdom, across Europe, and in the United States. What is startling is that three quarters of the deaths worldwide took place in low and middle income countries. The mortality rates of cardiovascular diseases have been declining in industrialized countries since the 1970s. This reduction is probably due to increased education in both the prevention and treatment of these diseases. The economic impact is wide ranging and increasing. The Center for Disease Control Foundation in 2015 reported that nearly 800,000 Americans die each year from heart disease, stroke, and other cardiovascular diseases. The foundation also projects that by 2030, medical costs associated with cardiovascular diseases will tip the scales at over $818 billion. Did you know that someone in the United States has a heart attack every 34 seconds? The direct and indirect cost of heart disease totals more than $300 billion. 
It's important that you remember that in order to reduce these costs, we must do a better job at educating Americans on how to turn the tide against this disease. And we'll learn more about this in upcoming sections.